Hey everyone, so the election is upon us and many in the Jewish community are asking themselves the question, which candidate would be better for the Jewish people overall, not only in foreign affairs, not only what's going on in the war in Israel and things going on in the Middle East, but the Jewish community at home. Because as we know, since October 7th, there's been a lot of uh, anti-Semitic incidents. Uh, there's been a tremendous increase, especially on college campuses uh, and so forth. And so here's a discussion, a debate between Sam Harris and Ben Shapiro, uh, kind of going back and forth. And just let's just watch it together. We're both worried about anti-Semitism and that we know it exists on the left and the right, but the really scary anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism that would give us you know, Timothy McVeigh-style terrorism and violence in America is on the right, right? We might be more annoyed by what's on the left, but if I told you that someone went into a synagogue this week and just murdered you know, 20 people at random, uh, and, the, and that person was not a jihadist, you, if you had to guess whether it was someone on the far right or some blue-haired person who'd you know, gone to the Ivy League and, and, and uh, was anti-Semitic in, in that vein, you would be you you like me would would you know win money all day betting it was cu coming from the far right because that's where the, the genuinely scary anti-semitism is um and then some so some of that is in is wrapped up in this populist uh phenomenon of trumpism but no there are many people who are just low information voters there are many people for whom wokeness and far left you know identity politics has become a, a single issue, you know, the, the, the single issue around which they're going to react, which I understand. I mean, I, I've found it as, as galling as you have. Uh, it just hasn't subsumed everything for me. I've, I've kept it in, in some proportion with other things that worry me. Um, but it's not a... Um, to, to recognize how pathological Trump is, to recognize the, 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 the message we are being given by the Republicans who have been close to him, who who... Uh, you know, ad nauseum will tell you he's unfit to serve. Um, the, 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 his behavior, his, ma his, his manifestly dysregulated behavior, where he, he seems to have nothing but contempt for our allies and nothing but praise for our enemies, right? And I mean, he's a, the fact that he, you know, while pr professing to be strong, is so obviously weak in that he's he's so easily manipulated by flattery, right? All you have to do is flatter him, and he's your guy. I mean, I, mean, I, I know you think, I mean, and, and there are many single-issue voters of this sort, you know, there, there are many Jews who, who are worried about Israel think that, well, Trump is better for Israel, so, you know, I'm a single-issue voter. I'm, I, you know, I, there's, there's nothing he can say or do, you know, bullshit or otherwise, uh, that is go going to get me to vote for Harris because I, I, I'm just worried about the, the, the survival of Israel. Well, Trump, I, I'll grant you, there, there, there have been hopeful signs of his support for Israel, certainly during his tenure as president, but Trump is in the Trump business. Again, I think he, if, if the mullahs in Tehran offered him a golf course deal somewhere, our policy could change. I mean, he's that venal. He's that... Uh, uh, uncoupled from any sane concern about international order and is that unprincipled and so i just think it's there's a corruption that runs you know all the way through the man that that is does not make him a reliable ally to anyone okay so there, there are a few things to respond to there so on the anti-semitism issue i mean i think it's sort of fascinating how, how you grouped you know the possibility of of terror attack on on a site obviously if you, if you there were a terror attack on a site today a jewish site today it would probably come from one of, historically, if you're looking at the last few years, one of three categories, right? Jihadist, and that means jihadist sympathizer, which today is more likely to be a Democrat, unfortunately. Or it could be a black Hebrew Israelite, which we've seen a couple of those, actually. Or it could be a white supremacist, right? Which, well, there was a shooting in Chicago over the weekend by a guy screaming Allahu Akbar. Correct, correct. Yeah. That's right. Well, um, don't and don't so, get so, me started on jihadism, because that'll <laughs> take the two hours. Well, an, er, an area where, where we certainly agree. I don't think there's this, any daylight there. But they, right. Exactly. But th th this is one of the, the – when you say genuinely scary anti-Semitism, it turns out that there are multiple forms of genuinely scary anti-Semitism. One is the sort of individual anti-Semite who goes and murders Jews. And then there is a second type of genuinely scary anti-Semitism, and that is a system-wide infusion of anti-Semitic worldviews into an entire party. And you are seeing that happen inside the Democratic Party right now. And that is very frightening to me as a Jew and as an American. When, when the, the intersectional 
ideology which suggests that victimization is equivalent to failure, that you failed in life, therefore you are a victim of something. And, and again, you, you can see that in a lot of grievance politics, but you see it in intersectional terms on the intersectional left. And the idea, therefore, that if you are Jewish, that means that you're successful, that means you're an exploiter. And, and that is now, that matrix is then applied to international politics in the way that, say, ta Coates has been applying it to the Israel-Palestinian situation. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a deeply held belief inside the Democratic Party. This is why, for example, by polling data, what you see is that Republicans support Israel, 66 to 8. And what you see is that the Democrats, barely plurality, maybe, support Israel. And among young Democrats, a plurality actually don't support Israel. They support the Palestinians. That, to me, is a, is a more systemically scary thing than, the, than, than what's been happening on, on the right. And again, you're talking to somebody who is a victim of, of an enormous amount of anti-Semitism, including from people like white supremacists in 2015, 2016. So it's not like I don't have any experience with this sort of stuff. They continue to hate me just as thoroughly as they ever hated me. And in fact, it's one of the reasons that many of them have gone anti-Trump is because I, I support President Trump. I've taken, as I mentioned before, I've, I've campaigned with President Trump. I've taken him to the OHEL. You know, like because of that, they are very angry with President Trump. The sort of speculation you have to get to, to the idea that Donald Trump is going to be more anti-Israel than the Biden-Harris administration after being the most pro-Israel president in American history. Just in political terms, he was the most pro-Israel president in American history. That is a far stretch. And as to the well, idea that President Trump is easy to manipulate on foreign policy, again, when it comes to his rhetoric, I, I, I don't disagree that, that very often he will say kind things about anyone who will say a kind thing to him. What I look to is what was the actual political outcome of his presidency. The actual political outcome of his presidency, under Barack Obama, there was an invasion of Ukraine. And under Joe Biden, there was an invasion of Ukraine. And under Donald Trump, there was no invasion of Ukraine. And that is because Donald Trump is wildly unpredictable. And it turns out that wild unpredictability in foreign policy, again, is not actually a particularly terrible thing to have. Some of that, by the way, is actual strategy by President Trump, believe it or not. President Trump has openly spoken about the fact that he will, he will bluster and he will threaten and you don't know quite what he's going to do. So you can attribute that if you want to, you know, sort of his natural instability. But the reality is that he actually sometimes applies that, that, that sort of unstable formula for foreign policy in a way that does scare off America's enemies. I think what, putting character aside, because I don't think that the two of you are going to see eye to eye on that question, I don't, I, I think that probably the strongest argument for Trump is his foreign policy legacy. Not just because wars weren't breaking out, but good things happened, like the Abraham Accords, like incentivizing European allies to take more responsibility for their defense. And I think the choice sometimes feels like you have, you know, perhaps stability, but weakness from her and craziness from him. Um, so mm. it feels sometimes like a choice between crazy and weak. Sam, I would love for you to contend with, you know, Ben's argument here that Trump's foreign policy, as blustery and frankly, crazy as he was and many of the things he said when he was president absolutely alarmed me. But looking back, did in retrospect, did it lead to a more stable world when you look at the foreign policy picture? Well, again, I, I had, as I said, I have reasons to think that looking back is not as instructive as we'd like it to be because there were so many guardrails in place which, which Trump smashed into and has vowed to remove for his second term, right? I mean, he, all these people who, who are warning us, you know, again, the, the 40 of the 44, the most senior, most appointees, all of these people were the guardrails. And they all came away saying, yeah, he crashed into me and, and eventually fired me because I wouldn't let him do that insane and illegal thing he wanted to do, right? I mean, we were talking about generals who had to, had to convince him that we couldn't use our nuclear weapons. Right. I mean, this is not <laughs> this is not a normal situation. Right. This is I mean, this is a, a, a Trump is somebody who thinks that you can stop wars if all you need to do to stop a war is to, to, to bring in some wheeler dealer from from Queens and negotiate it like it's a, a condo renovation. Right. I mean, I mean he's he's just this is this is all bullshit. Yeah, I mean, bullshit is the right word for for much of what comes out of his mouth. And um, yes, I'll grant you that he can seem crazy and unpredictable, and and you know because he is uh, somewhat crazy and and perhaps unpredictable. But he's not all that unpredictable. I mean, what he's predictably bent around by flattery. I mean, you can be as odious a person as 
the, the leader of North Korea that's kept his entire society in a, what is effectively a prison camp, and all you have to do is flatter the man, and he will, he will you know, claim to be in love with you, right? And as, as far as an ally with Israel, I mean, it's just like, you know, if, if memory serves, Trump's first utterance, the public utterance after October 7th, was not some completely sane and compassionate expression of solidarity with Israel. It was some petty criticism of Netanyahu because he had felt slighted by Netanyahu. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, he, he's the guy who, when the Twin Towers came down after 9-11, he jumped on the radio and said, you know, and many people say, I have the tallest building in New York now, right? I mean, that's the man. Right. That's a, the man who we've so, already elected. From a, but from a policy perspective, do you think a Harris administration would be better on Israel than a Trump administration? I do, because it would be staffed by sane people. And what, and, and what we have, again, do you want Mr. Pillow guy in, in the conversation with Mike Flynn and who, Candace Owens? Who's going to be in there? Jack Posobiec? I mean, like, no, I mean, on his, are, on his Israel policy, Mike Pompeo and David Friedman are the most likely people to be in the administration. And on Kamala Harris's side, it's most likely to be Philip he is Gordon. surrounded by grifters and maniacs. Uh, Sam, I know, I know, I know precisely the people talking to him. Right? <laughs> so that, yeah, that but, I'm not, I'm not speculating about that. I mean, one of the, one of the arguments. So there, there are a couple of things that I think are worth noting here. One is that you say that past performance is no indicator of future performance about him, and you also say that about her. So I, I grant you that, that there's consistency there. I tend to think that the best indicator of what no, a second no, term term will look like is what why. a first term will I, I can look tell like. you why it's not a, a, a good indicator for him. It's not the same dynamic doesn't hold for her. I mean, she's, again, she, so, so then will, so will a Kamala Harris term look like, so, so will a Kamala Harris term look like her first Kamala Harris term? And then just final point, you keep using the word normal. And I think there are a lot mm -hmm. of Americans who hear normal. And what they actually hear is situation normal all fucked up. <laughs> Meaning we've done normal politics a lot. And it turns right. out that it's kind of fucked up. And Trump, things were not normal, and things in terms of actual day-to-day -day life, economically, foreign policy-wise, were less. And so, would we all prefer a choice between normal and not fucked up, and normal and not fucked up? That'd be great. That not fucked up would be a great status quo. But the reality is that there are a couple different operative levels of normal. And one of the things that I think people want normalcy from is their lives. If people had felt satisfied that Joe Biden had restored normalcy when he came into office, he came into office with a popularity rating in the high 50 percent. And within a year, he had sunk those popularity ratings down into the low 40s because it turns out he was not normal. It turns out that he could say all the things that he wanted, that he could mutter whatever he wanted into a microphone. And Americans did not feel sanguine. They did not feel stable. They did not feel that him blowing out the spending, for example, or pulling out of Afghanistan, leaving billions of dollars behind while lying to the American people for months that everything was going to be totally hunky-dory over there. They didn't like that either. And so this kind of the, the, the reference to the word normal over and over and over to only refer to the behavior of the candidate as opposed to the, li the life lived by Americans is the reason that despite all the excesses, some of which you and I agree on, Donald Trump right now is running dead even with Kamala Harris and maybe ahead. Ben, just, just for the listener, I want you to explain who Phil Gordon is and who David Friedman. So you said Mike Pompeo and David Friedman or Phil Gordon. Explain, sure. explain so, who that is in the discussion. So Mike Pompeo and David Friedman are incredibly pro-Israel. David Friedman was the ambassador to Israel under Donald Trump. Uh, it, was, it was David Friedman and Mike Pompeo who worked with President Trump to, for example, broker the Abraham Accords along with Jared Kushner. They also helped move the, the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, a pledge that had been made by both parties and then failed by both parties until Donald Trump became president of the United States, who acknowledged the, the, the territorial sovereignty of the Golan Heights by the state of Israel. Phil Gordon is a, a foreign policy advisor to the Kamala Harris campaign. In the past, he has written about his desire to effectively normalize relations with Iran. The Kamala Harris-Joe Biden campaign obviously worked very heavily also with figures like Robert Malley, who actually it probably was compromised, as it turns out, by Iranian intelligence. You know, one of he's the being things, investigated. He's yeah. being investigated. I, I think it's very likely he was compromised by Iranian intelligence. Uh, you know, the, when, when, you, when you look at the, the team, I think one of the things that, that's sort of fascinating about the duality between Trump and, and Biden-Harris is something that, that Sam, you, you'd once suggested that one of the things that, uh, about Trump is that he obviously, in your opinion, has no principles, that he's completely variable, that he, that he does wild things, he says wild things, and that he doesn't have sort of a, a plotting, go-along, to uh, ideological sort of thrust. And I, I agree with, with some of that. I also think that if the ideological thrust of a campaign or candidate is wrong, that can be significantly more dangerous than the variability of the alternative candidate. Mm. And so I know exactly what I'm going to get from a Kamala Harris 
presidency with regards to the Middle East, because I know exactly what I got from Barack Obama and Joe Biden, and I see no difference. She can't even name a difference. So I have very significant doubts as to why I would expect a radical change in policy from Obama or Biden, except possibly to the left, if you listen to people like Bernie Sanders, who is now out publicly attesting that he believes he will have a receptive ear in the White House to a full arms embargo on the state of Israel. Sam, I think... Uh, I just just got to respond to some of that because... Yep. I, you know, I am like Ben, and I think like you, Barry, not satisfied with the, the noises that have come out of of Democrats' mouths since October seventh, right? So yeah, I, what I, I, I was, I was, I was simply going to pay you a compliment and say that of all of the people, sort of, I think you've you have been since October seventh the most powerful moral voice, let's say broadly on the center left on this question, which is why I think people are going to be really curious to understand why you think, again, putting it's impossible to put character to the side, but just on a policy level, why you have faith that the Democratic Party is going to be stronger against jihadism, stronger against Iran and more muscular in its support of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, on this issue, on the defense of Israel and a recognition that that Ultimately, regime change in Iran is a, is a, an imperative, and a moral it's a moral imperative. It's a, a geostrategic imperative. I mean, I consider myself right of John Bolton at this moment, right? So it's like it's not <laughs> you know that that's where I am, and and I should point out that John Bolton doesn't support Trump either, right? And he's he's very hawkish on this issue. Um, listen, Harris has an impossible task, I mean, she, and if she if she loses in, in next week, you will recognize that it was in fact impossible. But she, she has to hold this, or seem to hold this coalition together. And the coalition includes a lot of um, uh, liberal uh, and uh, confused young people who think that, you know, who've believed everything they saw on TikTok about the, the genocide in Gaza perpetrated by the evil IDF, right? I mean, that's, she, she, she needs those people to vote. Right. Otherwise, there's, you know, we will have a Trump presidency. Um, so on some level, you know, the, the fact that she is is as tongue tied as she is on this topic is is easily explained. Right. The fact that she uh, must always turn the corner when when expressing her full commitment to support of Israel and and her recognition that Israel has a right to defend itself. Seemingly, she always has to complete that sentence with. But of course, we need a ceasefire. And and there's been far too much death and destruction in Gaza, right? And it's been unconscionable, right? She has to she has to g- give that whole thought and never just the first part, right? Whereas the whole thought is completely incoherent. I mean, it, it is just in fact true that if you acknowledge that Israel is fighting an existential war against a death cult, you know, uh, that, that is using its own uh, civilians as as human shields. Uh, and you acknowledge that the IDF is doing a better job of that than we have ever managed, right, in terms of the, the ratio of you know, the killing of non-combatants to, to combatants. You know, it's something like one to one in Gaza, and it, it's been, you know, one to nine in, 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 in some of our conflicts with jihadists, right? So if you acknowledge that they're doing a better job than we have, you can't then complete the sentence with, but of course we need a ceasefire and, there, and there's been far too much death and destruction. In Gaza, and it's unconscionable, right? No, they're they're fighting a defensive existential war, and they're doing a better job of it than we ever have, and we should support them, right? That's the policy I want from my party, and that's the policy uh, whether we're going to get it rhetorically or not. That's the policy I think we will get from a Harris administration. I mean, if you look at what Biden has done, I mean, Biden in the, in the beginning, immediately after or after October 7th was great. I think Ben would acknowledge that that his going immediately to Israel was 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 great. And um, and Israel has gotten a ton of support. I mean, in, the, in this latest, I mean, the, there have been there have been hiccups and there's certainly been rhetorical uh, errors, but we have given more aid to Israel in the last year than we've ever given Israel. And in this latest mission where they, where they flew, you know, sorties over Iran, you know, my understanding is that there were American planes in the air, you know, ready to, to respond if any Israeli planes went down, right? So we are supporting them. What we aren't doing and what Kamala Harris can't afford to do for purely idiotic political reasons now is 
spell this out clearly in moral terms that would satisfy us, you know, the, the three of us, because there are so many morons on the far left who have yet to vote. Well, I think that is a very important point that uh, Sam Harris uh, does uh, end off on, is this idea that moral clarity is essential in assessing the situ situation and, and, quite frankly, uh, who to vote for, who is going to be the strongest candidate that is going to support the issues that are uh, correct when it comes, in, in this particular case, to foreign policy and to anti-Semitism at home. Uh, there, there is an interesting, uh, and, I, and I do think that Sam Harris, as a secular person, as a secular-minded person, someone who uh, is not coming from it from any sort of religious uh, intention or not, has a, has a, has a good secular uh, ideological understanding and, and moral clarity in the situation when, when it's talking about uh, Israel-Hamas war. Uh, there, there is an interesting story that, that had come out uh, a few, few months ago, I guess, that uh, when, when Donald Trump was uh, speaking with the representatives from the Taliban and, uh, and said to them, you know, we, we want to we make sure that when, 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 uh, when we're going to withdraw from this particular area that no, no Americans are harmed. And, uh, and then he, he pulls out a picture of the leader of the Taliban's house and he leaves it with him uh, as like safekeeping, saying that basically like if an American is harmed, then um, th I know exactly where you live and I'm going to come and get you. And as it turned out, no Americans were harmed. And this sort of strong man uh, foreign policy when it, when it comes to the Middle East uh, can be uh, quite effective, as as we have seen, and so uh, th this is an interesting debate. Different different uh, ideas to uh, to think about and whatnot. Love to hear what you think about it uh, in the comments below. And if you enjoy this content overall, please consider hitting that subscribe button over there uh, in the corner. And uh, love to stay in touch. Have a great day, everybody.